Hey, we're part of this, we've been doing this series called Right Moves. We've been kind of taking words from scripture and thematizing them throughout and be like, what does this word mean and what is the exhortation for us as believers? And as we get ready for a new year, many of you guys, we might be holding on to some kind of expectations for um, New Hope, new, sorry, New Year's resolutions. We should call those New Hope resolutions. Wow. Anyway, so New Year's resolutions, those kinds of things. I have New Hope resolutions. Um, but for many of us, we start getting so caught up in the tasks, we forget that there's actually a posture that our heart carries that the Lord might want to actually help us navigate first. Before we think, what am I doing this year? God's being like, who are you becoming? How are you walking in transformation? And from there, God's going to set us up for success. And so we get these four big words. I actually put them in a food pyramid so that we can see how they work together. So these are the four big words we walked with. We started with sitting. The Bible says a lot about sitting, and these are both metaphorical and tangible expressions in Scripture. So sitting isn't just literally about bending your knees, right? We talked about it's about waiting on the Lord. I'm going to rest and be faithful in the resting. I'm going to be quiet and still before him and hear his voice. Sitting is a posture of intimacy with the Lord. And so for all of us, that's why it's the bottom of the food pyramid. For all of us, every single year should start with how deep is my intimate connection with Jesus? And it feels like if we're trying to run when we haven't sat yet, we're, we're going to find ourselves in trouble because this is where we hear his voice. This is where we get clarity on purpose is when we sit with the Lord. Then sitting moves to standing, standing firm. There's things in this world we got to stand firm in. The world is changing. Culture is changing. And if we're not standing firm in our faith, we're going to get pushed around like the wind. And the Bible says it very clearly, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Our faith is largely about standing firm in the knowledge and truth of Christ, standing firm against the schemes of the enemy, and just seeing what the Lord does. And that moves us into walking. For all of us, we walk out our faith in different ways. We're called to be um, sort of edifiers of this world, salt and light of this world, and that takes action. It takes us moving our feet and being present and ready for people. And so today we're talking about this idea of running. What does it mean to run spiritually? The Bible actually says a lot about it. But before that, I'm going to tell you a story. The fastest I've run in my life. You guys ready for this? You probably, I don't think I've shared this one before. When I lived 2007, I, I lived in Africa for a little bit. I was doing a, a study abroad program and I joined the basketball team. And our, our team captain encouraged us. He says, guys, we're out of shape. We need to run. And so I was like, you know what? I'm in my young 20s. I, my knees still work. So I'm like, I'm going to get up and run every morning. So I went and ran, and our, the campus that I went to was actually in a very uh, rural area. There wasn't a lot of buildings around it, so we saw wildlife all the time. Um, it's Africa, so like wildlife just shows up. So I went for a run early in the morning. We had one of those big iPods. Remember the ones that you had to like scroll circular with your finger? Some of you guys were around for that one. So I had that one. I was like scrolling, looking for a song, like scrolling in circles, and I couldn't find the song and I was trying to listen to. And I'm just jogging, and I look up, and I see probably like... I don't know, yeah, like here to the back wall, I'm just see something kind of, it's kind of hazy out, and I'm like, what is that one, Pitbull? When Pitbull, what is the Pitbull doing out here? So I look at him, and I'm like, bro, that's not one Pitbull, it was on Hyena. <laughs> so this is a true story. So I see the Hyena, he kind of just stops, kind of looks at me, not super interested, he was running, doing something. I have never run so fast in my life that when I saw that hyena, I'm like, I'm going back to school. And I just started booking it back to school. What's funny was some friends on my team saw me because the, the school's kind of perched high above the road. And they saw me and they're like, bro, I've never basically, like, how these aren't supposed to be running that fast kind of thing. That was basically what they were implying. It's like, why were you, like, how could you possibly be running so fast? And I noticed this, and I don't know if it's true in your life. Most of the time we do our fastest running when we're out of sphere running from something. Isn't that true? All of us run from something. Uh, we all have, and that this could be a spiritual thing. A lot of people move to Hawaii, and I love it when people move to Hawaii and we get to meet all these new people. But then you start talking story, and they're like, I came to Hawaii because things in the mainland were great. I'm running from something, right? For many of us, we're running from um, uh, so many things. Fear drives us. You could be running from relationships. You could be running from a bad work situation. You could just be running from life and, and the atmosphere that you grew up in and you want change. And um, I heard it said this way. You guys know Pastor Jonah says it the best. He's like, you know, nothing is faster than the speed of light. But Jonah says it this way. He's like, bro, you know, it's faster than the speed of light. I said, what's that? Darkness running from light. <laughs> Amen. The one thing that's faster than light is darkness running from it. But here's the thing. I want to propose this morning that there is 
a speed that is faster, that is driven by love, not by fear. That we can actually run towards something faster than we can run away from something. Are you tracking? And the Bible tells us, this is what you run towards. But if we don't see it in scripture, we're going to miss it. And we're only going to run our fastest pace when the hyenas come out. (laughs) Amen. So we're going to open scripture this morning. But first, I need you to pinch your fingers because we're going to get into the Greek. And this helps you pronounce better. I don't know if you knew that. So when you pinch your fingers, it actually helps your pronunciation of Greek. So we're going to introduce you to the word run in Greek. It's trejo. Everyone say trejo. 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 Thank you. If you pinch your fingers, you're like, wow, I pronounced that really well. Um, Trejo literally means to run. But it has three kind of spiritual connotations attached to it. The first one is this, to move in haste. There are times in our life we got to move with haste. Amen? There's a time for walking and walking out our faith and pace, the pace of Jesus, three miles an hour being present, and that's true. There are some times in this life where God's like, move with haste because things are happening. Amen? Um, number two, exerting great strength to overcome. Like we saw in that video, endurance is a massive part of our race. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So sometimes running actually means, hey, I'm going to exert my, con- the consistency of my steps is showing my exerting myself to overcome the trials and tribulations in my life. And number three is this, focusing your energy on achieving something. And this is the one I want to kind of really kind of underline today. What does it mean to run in this life by means of focusing our energy on achieving something? Many of us have achievements, think goals. I want to get a better job. I want to climb the ladder. I want to get my degree. I want to do this. I want to get married. I want to have kids. We have achievement already set in our minds, and we want to chase that, and we want to run after those things. And today, what I want to do is look at Scripture and see what does Scripture tell us to chase? I really want to know if it lines up. And so we're going to start with this verse. You might have heard this before. It is packed with spiritual truth. Check this out. Hebrews 12 says this, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen. There's a huge assumption in this verse that there's a race marked out for you. Isn't that awesome? That God loves you so much, he's actually put markers in your life and says, hey, travel this way, run this way. Now, I don't know if you see it. Here's a picture of um, Makapu'u Lighthouse. It gives me a great, when you go the trail at Makapu'u, you see all these little like pillars that kind of line up. I, I don't know what they're for. I wonder sometimes if they just forgot to complete construction of a wall or something. But what's cool is, they're, they're like exactly like 15 feet apart or something, so you can actually use them to distance how much farther it is to the lighthouse. Isn't that interesting? This is the point of markers in your life, that God has given you a race, he's marked a race, and he's put markers to guide you so you know where to run, how much longer it's going to be, and most of important is are you running in the right direction? Are you actually ch- chasing the right things? So the first point, if you want to take notes this morning, the first point is this, is that running In this life, running spiritually, running in 2024 means choosing to stay in the race. Many of us know we have a call. We know we have a race marked out for us by the Lord himself, but we choose not to run it for whatever reason. One thing that makes my heart sing is when I hear of people like, Pastor Mark, I grew up in church. A lot of things happened and I went away, but now I'm back and I'm pursuing the Lord again. It's like, yes, yes you've received the race again, right? And not to say race, the race doesn't have obstacles. There's hurdles in the race. But for when we see, I love it, when I see believers, people who know Jesus is real, even despite circumstances in life, say, I'm going to choose this race. I'm going to run it. I'm going to run it well. And if, if you're kind of like in the beginning of things and you're like, I don't know about this Jesus and I don't know if he has a race marked, here's, a, here's what I know is true. He has marked out a race for you. The question is, do you see the signs? Do you see those pillars? Do you see the things that guide along the way? And you will if you choose him. So question for you, though, is if God has a race marked out for you, what are we actually chasing after? What is that? What are we pursuing? We can be pursuing all of our dreams, our vocational dreams, our relational dreams, all of our dreams. 
But if it misses what, what we're actually supposed to be running after, we might miss totally what the Lord has in store for us. I love this verse in Psalm 17, oh, 119. Check this out. Here's what the psalmist runs toward. I run in the path of your commands. <laughs> For you have broadened my understanding. Isn't that beautiful? When God gives me commands, do you still see them as rules? Do you see, do you, or do you see them as markers along a path saying like, hey, these commandments are meant to keep you on a path that's going to bring you life. Or do you see it as like, oh, Christianity, it's all about do this, do don't, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. No, no, no. This is actually God's way of marking out a life that's going to lead to eternal like well-being, eternal flourishing. And it starts in this life. We don't have to wait till heaven. It actually starts now. I run in the path of your commands. Wow. I'm chasing the commandments of the Lord because he's brought in my understanding of understanding why they exist. That they're actually good for me. They're good for my family. They're good for our church. These are good things for humankind. The commandments of Christ. Amen. And so this is, check this out. This is my favorite race in the Bible. Do you know there's a couple races in the Bible? So Ephesians, oh, sorry, it says Ephesians 5. It's actually John 20, sorry. Uh, John 20 says this. Peter and the other disciple, Jesus just rose from the tomb. It says that they ran for the tombs. Turn to someone next to you and say, run to the tomb. They ran to the tomb. If you heard for the first time that Jesus, who you followed for three years, died, and wait, he's not actually there anymore in the tomb? Are you walking to that tomb or are you running? You're running, right? We'll come back to that. So this is an invitation to run. Both were running, Peter and John. The other disciple outran Peter, that's John, and reached the tomb first. Gold medal. Woo! Gold sticker for John. Finally, the other disciple, Peter, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. Oh, sorry. Peter went inside first, then John. Look at this. He saw and believed, for until then they did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. When you chase the empty tomb of Christ, your mind will be broadened, as the psalmist says, too, and you'll realize this is something worth running after. Amen? And if you're like, what are you talking about, Pastor Mark? The truth of the resurrection of Christ changes everything. So I am chasing an empty tomb means that I'm not settling for what the world is offering me. I'm chasing a resurrection life. Amen? When people say that can't be healed, I'm chasing the tomb. Amen? When people say that your relationship is too broken, you should just leave them and move on. But the scripture is saying, no, actually, all things are reconcilable, reconcilable in Christ. I'm chasing the tomb. Amen? So this is what the Christian life asks for. What are you chasing? I am chasing the resurrection power of Jesus. That's what the disciples knew. They knew if, that, if Jesus was truly out of that grave, then all of the reality that we live in has changed. And if that reality has changed, I want that now. I want that in haste. Amen? I'm not lollygagging to the tomb. Does that make sense? I'm chasing that with everything I have. This is a spirit of imminency that the Lord is moving and all of us, we have to foster. Remember how um, Joseph and Leslie shared last week? They said, the biggest way to activate your faith for miracles, for healings and all those things is what? To foster a hunger. I want to see the things of the Lord. If that tomb is empty, I want to see it with my own eyes. When I see it with my own eyes, I'm going to be transformed by the power of the resurrected Christ. That's what we're chasing. Amen? So with haste, chase these things. And I'm usually the gracious pastor type. I'm going to be like, oh, you just started reading your Bible. That's so good. Do it when you can. Pray when you can. And sometimes, like in my spirit this week, the Lord is like, bro, there are some things in this life where chase them because spend your energy there. Go with haste. Go with imminency to expect the Lord to show up. Don't, again, lollygag your way into the presence of the Lord. But if he's there, meet him. Amen? Because life will be changed. Your life will be forever altered because of the experience and the encounters you have with Jesus. So when it comes to reading your scripture, uh, or Jesus is going to speak when I open these pages. I'm chasing that Bible. Amen? That's it. When I pray... Things change. I can change. Atmospheres change. My family changes. Relationships change when we pray. I'm chasing prayer. (laughs) Amen? So these are the things. This is what it means to chase the tomb. Chase the resurrection power of Jesus. Don't look at them as things you have to do. Look them as markers for a resurrection life that is full of glory and power and love and compassion. And when you see that, God's going to expose that and you're going to be like, brah, there is no other life worth living. Amen? Is that making sense? Cool. Just checking. So 
here's another thing. Like, anybody else? Okay, so number two, spiritually, we always run towards the tomb. Always run towards it. Don't run away from it. Run towards it. If you're going to run in any direction, where is Jesus in this situation? And this is a good navigator for any situation. If people are beefing, your friends are scrapping, and you don't know how to make things right, where is Jesus in this situation? This year, we'll have to vote in a very tense American election. Run towards the tomb. Don't run towards a candidate. Don't run towards a party. Run towards the tomb. What does that mean? Allow the Lord to speak that over you. But pursue him. Pursue the things of Christ. Christ, where are you in this? Jesus, where are you moving? I want to see you. I want to see your glory. Have the haste, the hunger in your spirit to see more of the Lord's work. Amen? So there's a great picture. When, Jesus, or when that passage in Hebrews says this, and actually, sorry, slide people, can you go back up to the Hebrews verse? In, in verse number two, it says this, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. There's a huge hint there. What does it mean to run authentically in our faith? Where's your eyes at? You're going to go where your eyes are fixed. My son Jude is competitive, and we bike. We live on a loop, so we bike around the loop. But around corners, it's hard. Like, guys, stay to the right, stay to the right, because if you're in the left lane, a car could come around and whoop, right? So Jude is so competitive, he's looking at his brother and sister. He literally bikes with his head sideways. And guess where he ends up? Almost hitting cars, rubbish cans, and street signs. Why? Because his eyes aren't fixed on the road, right? It's really simple. This is what he's asking us to do. If you're going to run the race marked out for you, where do your eyes have to be? Above, on Jesus. That's where your eyes have to be. And there's a great story. There's an, uh, an illustration of where this failed in Scripture. It's out of 1 Samuel. So David just killed Goliath. You remember that story? Big guy, oh, I'm going to kill all the Jews. And he's like, nope, what? And then, whoop, and then, and then done, right? <laughs> Goliath, pow. So when they come back to town, it says this. They're all like, dun da dun now, right? Because they just killed Goliath. So when the men were returning home, after David killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, because King Saul was the one who said, yeah, let David go, with joyful dancing. And they sang and danced, danced. Saul has slain thousands, but David, he's slain tens of thousands, right? How awesome does it feel as the king? You've slain thousands, but that David, oh, he's slain tens of thousands, which is ironic because he just slayed one. But first, and then it goes on. It says, Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with 1,000. Oh, me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Scholars kind of agree this is the shifting point in Saul's heart where he, God can't trust him with the kingdom anymore. Why? Because his eyes weren't fixed on God anymore. They were fixed to the side. I'm so worried about what David's doing. I've lost sight of what God actually wants me to do with this kingdom. Are you tracking? This is our life. Run the race marked out for you. Don't walk the race marked out for somebody else. Comparison will absolutely destroy God's vision for your life. Absolutely. It clouds it. It makes it murky. It takes your joy. It steals anything beautiful in this life because you can always look to the side and see someone else doing better or getting more, getting ahead faster. But if you recognize that Lord has marked a race out for you uniquely, there's a trust in that, that, Lord, if you've called me to this, if I'm walking in this path, I'm trusting it. And when I look to the side, God bless you. You make more money than me. God bless you. You have a, a better degree than me. God bless you. You're doing better in life. God bless you. You're married and have kids and I don't. God bless, right? Because it's not about comparison anymore because I'm fixed on my path. And the Lord has called me there. So I don't ever want to compare to what other people have because it's going to rob me. And that's what the enemy is trying to do is make people who are running in the same direction as you feel like enemies. David and Saul were on the same team. In that moment, Saul made David an enemy because of his jealousy. So this is what the Lord is saying. If you're going to run that path, fix my eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me. And when we do that, we're going to see so much fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. So here's the next point. Run with your eyes up. Run with your eyes up. As you run this race of faith, as you f f pursue hastily the things that God has called you to do this year, 
Keep your eyes fixed on him. And that's not just sort of a Christian cliche. That's actually, you're going to run into problems if your eyes deviate in any different way. This is actual real tangible wisdom. And then, you know, the next question after that is, whose race are you running? For many of us, we live actually, we run in this life by way of expectation of somebody else. Kids, we learn this really fast. If you're a youth or young adult, you start transitioning. You're like, wait a minute, as I become an adult, I'm realizing that was my parents' expectation for me. My, I feel like what the Lord is pushing me to do is a little bit different. And this is a really big part of coming into our own faith, is learning to run my race. And not my race in a selfish way, but the race that the Lord has marked out for me. And more often than I should say, with parents and kids, parents actually help kids see the race marked out for them. So listen to your parents, honor your parents, because they see it. But for all of us, we have to check whose expectations are we operating under. Are we trying to get ahead in this life because that's what we're supposed to do? Are we like killing it like in work and just doing great big things because that's what gets us applause? What is the motivating factor behind the race that we're running? And if it's not simply this, that I want to see the tomb of Jesus. I want to see him magnified, glorified, his power manifested, the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that our motivations might be skewed. So check your heart. I check my heart too. We'll all do it together. (laughs) Amen. But we got to run our own race. Now, I don't know about you. Running in this life doesn't mean striving. It doesn't mean like hustling and hustling. Those aren't actually words in the the kingdom's vocabulary. You got to strive and do more. You got to hustle and do this. It's actually running when you have clarity on what God's called you to do. I love how C.S. Lewis says it. He says it like this. If someone can run without getting tired, I don't think anyone often would do anything else. Amen? Sports people, if you had an opportunity to run your fastest pace at all times without getting tired, would you opt into that as a superpower? Absolutely. Imagine that. I can run my fastest speed forever and not grow tired. What is C.S. Lewis here saying? He's actually echoing a promise we get in Isaiah that's radical. You guys ready for this? Because we kind of read over it because it's poetic, but think about what the promise is. He who waits upon the Lord shall be renewed in strength. They'll rise up with wings as eagles. They're going to run without growing weary. And they will, what is it? Walk without fainting. Thank you. (laughs) Walk without fainting. Think about that. The promises of when we stay true to God's commandments, you can actually run in this life without getting weary. That's okay. You realize half of you don't even believe me right now. They're like, I've been running for a while in this faith, Pastor Mark. I'm just reading what the prophet's saying. He's saying, if you wait on the Lord, if you let him mark your path, if you let him lead you and say, come this way, I'm calling you here, here's what's going to happen. You're going to run down that path and you're not going to get tired. You're actually going to find rest for your soul in Jesus' words. This is the the life of pursuing Jesus. There is no such thing as spiritual burnout when the Lord is in it. (laughs) Amen? This is a crazy thing to think about, but I would say challenge that. Challenge that because we're so worried all the time, like, oh, I don't want to overstress you and overwork you, overburden you. If the Lord's called me to do it, I want you to let me free so I can run. (laughs) Amen? That's, I don't know about you, but I feel that sometimes. So, follow this promise. Running, and this is, this is a really important part of what scripture promises too, is that running is actually the result of clear purpose. What makes you run and pursue God's truth, God's goodness, his life for you in this life? It's when you get clarity on purpose. I know what I've been called to do. I know how he's gifted me. I know what the Lord is doing in my life. Not every step. The Lord doesn't reveal everything all at once. But I'll say this. Running is the result of clear purpose. I'm going to walk until I hear the Lord blow the whistle and say, like, this way now. Then I'm like, okay, boom. If the Lord's saying it, I'm going to go. Um, I had a really cool testimony this morning was Holly came up to me. Holly from the Connection Table is awesome. And Holly's like, Pastor Mark, Lani Huli, the, the building that I'm in, has a prayer group um, with multiple tiers. It's a very organized prayer system in Lani Huli. And she said, there's one captain and then a few people under them and a few people under them. And it's like a pyramid scheme of prayer, basically. And she said, Pastor Mark, I've been there for six months. Guess who they asked to be the captain of it? And I said, you. She's like, yeah, it's me. And what I love about it, she's just started right away. It's like, we're going to do this. We're going to talk about gossiping. We're going to talk about walking in identity. We're going to start praying over these things for our people. We're going to pray for miraculous healing over our people. And boom, she is not walking, right? She's running because she said, if the Lord has platformed me here, 
Why would I lollygag? I'm running. I'm running with that. So here's my question for you. What does it look like? Where has God placed you? And what has God put before you where you're like, I feel like I should be running, but maybe I'm not yet. Maybe I should be moving with more haste in this. For some of us, it's actually the process of healing. You've been holding on to things, and it's time to like go and see therapist, right? To go and actually start talking. It's a brave thing to start doing the inner work of walking out some of the things, the traumas and the, the situations that have happened to us. But that's actually running with the, the truth and the knowledge of Christ in your life. It's like, I'm going to pursue healing at all costs. Some of us, again, it's, it's actually this. It's church. It's jumping into ministry. Some of you guys um, have been wanting, and I, and I know this because I've been talking with a handful. I sense that a lot of people have been wanting a true encounter with the Holy Spirit. Don't drive here on Tuesday night. Run here on Tuesday night, right? Symbolically, run here. And it's not that the Lord only shows up on Tuesday night in this, this short little window, but I promise you this is when the way that the Lord has put this encounter night together, that we're expecting the Lord to come and show up to speak, to move in healing and in power, and it's going to be amazing. So be here, right? But what does it look like for you to actually not just walk things and be cautious, but actually run towards something? Even if it's scary, even if it's in an uncomfortable arena, the Lord has something for the runner. And here's the final promise. Don't you realize, says 1 Corinthians, says Paul, that in a race, who runs in a race? Everyone. But only one person gets the prize. So run to win. And now Paul's not saying this, that there's like a competition for Christians, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying this, run as if you're competing against the things of this world or against ideas, right? Um, against the enemy himself. Run as if you're going to beat him, overcome something in this life. So run to win. Don't run just to run, right? Don't kind of go through this life like, oh, I'm just going to go and see what the Lord does, there's actually a part of our faith that says, no, I'm going to run and expect to win. <laughs> Why? Because Christ has already won. So all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that's going to fade away. But we, as believers, we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with what? With purpose. I run with purpose in every step. I got to see this last week, the... Um, our awesome seven gen Lottie Kai Athletics team put on the biggest sporting event in history in Hawaii, which was awesome. And like to be in there and like feel the energy and the environment was unbelievable. For them to get to the point of running with an idea that has been stewing for a long time came with purpose. And we've had them up here before, but if you talk to Ed, Sivan, Nick, and these others, what's the purpose? We're blessing kids of Hawaii at the end of the day. It narrows down to there are kids here that need to be loved and blessed, and we can do that through volleyball. Amen? That's amazing. So run with purpose in every step. When my purpose is going to start dictating every single other thing that I choose to do. I'm not shadow boxing, right? He's giving the, <laughs> the, the imagery of a, a boxer. I'm not fighting nobody. This isn't just a dance we do in Christianity. Does that make sense? This isn't a game. We're not just messing around and just being like, oh, look at, look how holy I am, right? Shadow boxing, nobody. Win, beat something, fight the enemy, destroy him, overcome him as Christ did, right? This is what he's saying. Overcome, run with purpose. I discipline my body like an athlete, training to do what I should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I might, myself will be disqualified. I can tell you, Paul's saying this, I can preach all day to you. Go and live a life of faith. But if I'm not disciplining my own body to do what I'm preaching, I'm already disqualifying myself. So for many of us, we have to take this movement from what I believe to what I'm putting into practice. What does that look like? For you to start running with things that you've been preaching. You've been making social media posts about this, but have you done anything about it? Right? We can't practice. We have to practice what we've been preaching. And this is the danger of being a preacher. I'll tell, you for, <laughs> I'll tell you firsthand experience. But here's the greatest thing. He says this, runners, you run for an eternal prize. And what is that prize? I don't know if you've thought about that before. What's the purpose of this life when we get to the very end? And I did a great job. Here it is, if you're taking notes. Running well pleases God. He's so, en he's enamored with us. When we've chosen the right path, 
when we've said yes to his commands, when we've actually been obedient in walking that out, and when we've acted hastily when he's called us to move hastily and not dragged our feet. What does that mean for you to run, to take seriously some of the imminence that you might feel in your heart, that tug that God has pulling? Well, what does that look like to start running with that? And I love this. This is the last verse, and we're going to pray. This is Paul telling Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. What does it look like to run this life well? Is no matter what hurdles, if I fell down, whatever it looks like, I got back up and I finished the race and I kept the faith. Amen? Life is not easy. Life is going to throw us hurdles. It's going to lead us in all kinds of crazy places. But if we trust the Lord, He's going to use those markers to bring us back to His path and we're going to find so much life when we hit that finish line. Amen? Final question as we pray is, what can you run with in 24? What can you run with? And I'm not talking about like, I'm going to explore this lightly. We're talking about top of the food pyramid, right? There's things to walk with and to go caution, like move our feet slowly into different seasons. There's also things that like, I know this is true. I got to run to this. I got to change my mind quick. I got to, I got to get going. I got to move. I got to move the needle in my life. I'm tired of seeing the needle stay over here. I'm like, why is nothing in my life changing? It's because you haven't run to it. You haven't fully invested energy and resources into it. And the Lord's like, oh, try wait. When you do them, let's see what God does in your life. Amen? Can we stand together? And we're going to pray for that. And I want to just spend time with the Lord and ask him that question. Like a baton in a race, you carry something. So he's like, if something's been passed to you, what does the Lord want to pass to you so that you can run it? Run it to the next person. Run it to the next stage of life, whatever that means. Let's bow our heads. Holy Spirit, we just want to give you a moment to ask you this question. Lord, are we walking when we should be running? Are we standing still out of fear? Are we sitting down out of contentment somewhere in life where you're like, get up and move. I need you to move here. Lord, could you make that clear right now? What that looks like for each one of us. I just sense that for many in here, running might mean actually pursuing forgiveness rather than letting hurt and bitterness linger. For some of us, there might be projects, initiatives, things God's put on our hearts, and we're too scared to take the first step. And God's like, get moving and I'll show you where to go. For some of us, it might just be a a simple act of faith. Lord, I want to run to you. I know who you are, and I've been listening from the sideline about you. I've been like Zacchaeus in the tree, listening from afar to your teaching. But it's time to invite you into my home. Whatever it might be, what do you need to run with? What do you need to actively pursue this year? We thank you, Jesus, that there's grace for our pace. That weren't, you're not in a hurry, and neither are we. We also want to thank you, Lord, for these, the imminency of our spirit to know that this world is coming to an end and we have so much time on this earth that we want to make the most of every moment. Lord, help us to steward our decisions, steward our thoughts, steward every precious opportunity and moment we are given in this life so that you might take hold of it and do something miraculous with it. Lord, help us to run to you because we know where there is an empty tomb, There, there is power. There, there is deliverance. There, there is love. There, there is forgiveness and compassion like we've never experienced. So Jesus, may we be the type to race to that tomb when we hear that it's empty. 
And so, Lord, we just ask uh, for just covering as a church body right now, Lord, that this would be a year of clarity on purpose, that we would have such a, uh, an insight, Lord, from you, a download from your Holy Spirit that would say, this is where I want you to go. This is what I want you to do. And because this is where you're going to meet me. This is where the empty tomb lies in your life. This is where you need to see the resurrection power of Jesus come alive. And so, Lord, may we be sensitive to your Spirit's leading into whatever that looks like. Jesus, we thank you in advance for the healing that's going to take place this year, for the marriages that are going to happen, and the marriages that are going to get fixed this year. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for the baptisms and the salvations and the, the people who are choosing you this year. We know, Lord, that running is going to happen, but may we start the race well and prepare well, Lord, for what you're about to do this year. So, Jesus, we honor you with every ounce of our being. We love you. And Jesus, we just give you room to do whatever you want to do in each one of our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.